Facebook. We want to welcome you. We thank you so much for being here and joining with us. Um, this message is heavy upon my heart, um, and I believe it's just for you. So um, try to avoid all distractions, what's going on, and just really focus on what, what God is saying to you. And I believe that you'll be better because of it. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, we're going to use this and another scripture as the text for the next four weeks. We're starting a brand new series today that I want to call, or it came to my heart, to call it Overcoming the Obstacle. This is the first of four parts, as, I can, as far as I can see. And we're going to talk about you overcoming the obstacle and with that, we want to look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. The Bible says here that we are to follow peace with all men. Another translation said pursue peace and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15 also says that we should look diligently lest any of us, while we're trying to pursue peace with people, we also need to look diligently on the inside of us unless any one of us fail of the grace of God, unless any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So as I said, this is going to be a brand new series. This actually came to me by direction of the Lord. I was in a conference about a week and a half ago and really just looking to the Lord for what to minister to you for this year. And of course, we just finished an amazing series based on a prophetic message. And I could really pick up and start talking about the pieces of that and helping us do our part to see this year be a better year than it's ever been. But what came to my heart was that we needed to talk about overcoming the obstacle. What is it that's keeping you from your next level? Whatever that thing is, it is an obstacle in your path. And I want to show you from the word of God that you can overcome that and reach to the potential that God has for your life. Now, I especially want to invite married couples to pay particular, uh, particular attention to this series. I try to avoid saying that this is a marriage series because then you exclude individuals that are unmarried. This message is from the Lord to every person, whether you're married or single. But I sense in my heart that marriages are under attack right now in the world, particularly where God's children are concerned. And there's some things in this series that will minister to you deeply, whether it be individually or whether it be in your marriage. So as the scripture says, let any man that has ears to hear, let him hear. In this series, it's broken up into four parts just to kind of whet your appetite. And talking about overcoming the obstacle, the first thing we're going to talk about today is overcoming the obstacle of self. Next week, we're going to deal with overcoming the obstacle of history. And the week after that, Lord willing, we're going to overcome the obstacle of Babel. That's what I'm going to call it, but it's actually communication. And then the fourth is overcoming the obstacle of money. I encourage you, don't miss any part of this. And if you're joining us live online, then set it in your mental calendar to come back and check us out later. Amen? But we want to talk today about overcoming the obstacle of self. Looking at and learning how to overcome whatever it is that's keeping you from your next level. But what if it is you keeping you from your next level? Who is it that's stopping you from getting to the place in life and in God that you want to be. It's possible that you need to learn how to get out of your own way and overcome the obstacle of self. There's a second scripture that goes in line with this particular series. And it's here in Mark chapter 
10, where there was a, a young man, maybe just like you, that came to Jesus. I mean, this morning, all of us had a come to Jesus moment. I mean, you came to church. Well. And this young man, just like you did, you've come to God because you're really trying to have better in life. You really want to get to the good life that God has for you. And you came to him with questions. What must I do in order to inherit, inherit eternal life? Get to the, to the life that God has for me. And sure enough, Jesus said, well, you know, why do you call me good? Which was an indication there's something going on in you that you're not recognizing. You're coming to me one way, but there's something deeper going on. He says, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But you know the commandments. And, and Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, knew that he knew. You know what the word says. You know right from wrong. You know to love your neighbor. You know to worship God. You know not to steal. You know not to kill. You know not to covet your neighbor's stuff. Well, the young man spoke up and he said, Master, I've done all these things from my youth. In part, you could ask the question, well, what are you asking him for? In other words, there was something in him that brought him to this place. And Jesus is about to put his finger on it. In verse 21, Jesus said, in a very loving way, he looked at him and he said, there's one thing that you lack. Do this. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come Take up the cross and follow me. The Bible immediately after this says that that young man walked away from Jesus, not doing the, the one thing that would cause him to get to the next level in life. He walked away being grieved and sad at that saying. What if that was you? And what if it was just one thing in your life that's keeping you from the next level that you desire. Notice, I ask, what is it that's keeping you? And what if that one thing was yourself? Notice I didn't say, who is it that's keeping you from that next level? You know why I say that? Because people are not that powerful in your life. Thank God for our spouse. But he said, have no other God beside me. So we can't put our spouse on the throne of which only God should sit. And so that means nobody has that kind of control or authority to take from you what God has already provided for you. I like how the book of Joshua says it. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, God was talking to, to, to Joshua as he's about to go into the land. He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. You and God, child of God, are a majority. That means people aren't your problem. They're not that big enough. They're not that bad enough to keep you from your next level. So I don't ask you, who is it that's keeping you up, throwing you off, and preventing you from having the life that God intends for you to have? No, I'm saying, what is it? And could it be that it's just one thing that you lack? One thing that you lack. And then, what if that one thing was you? What if you are actually the problem and preventing you? from reaching. Now, obviously, people have a, an extreme influence upon our lives. Maybe they did something to us or are doing something. Or maybe even it's how we're processing what's going on in those relationships. But people are not your problem. Maybe how you're handling what they did or doing or how you're processing it internally is your problem but people aren't your problem. So the, the first focus, even for those that are married, is really to look at you. Because obviously they don't have no problem with what they're doing. You're the one that had the problem. 
with what they're doing. So I first want to challenge you to look at you. In the book of 2 Timothy, are you all ready for this today? In 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 25, the apostle Paul is writing to a young pastor, and he's teaching him how to minister to the people of God. He says, in meekness, instruct those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What's interesting, and I highlighted it here, is that he is instructed to help people who are in opposition to themselves. If I understand that right, he's talking about helping people that are, themsel are themselves their own problem. Have you ever been in opposition with yourself? You know, I mean, it could be as simple as what you want to wear. Well, I don't like that. I like that. Or I want to do my hair like this. Or I don't like that. I don't know about you. There have been times in my life where I have opposed to me, where in other words, I wanted to do one thing, but then I did another. In other words, in that moment, I am conflicted. I'm double minded and I am actually in opposition with myself. I mean, even Job experienced this. God showed up and started talking to him about him. And he got to the place where he said in verse 6 of Job chapter 42, he said, wherefore I abhor myself, I repent in dust, and, in, in dust and ashes. Have you ever been there where you've done something where you hate yourself as a result? Have you been there where you're going through something in life and you hate your life? You young people, I, I pray that you're hearing me today. I hate myself. I hate this that's going on in my life. Well, the Bible instructs me as your pastor to instruct you, teach you from the word of God in case you are in self-opposition. It's one thing for a person to try to be against you, but it's another when you are against you. Paul the Apostle, uh, I mean, you, you should be able to relate to this. He was in the same place where many of us are. He said in Romans chapter 7 and verse 15, he says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. I don't understand why I'm still in this marriage. I don't understand why I'm still working on this job. I don't understand my family. I don't understand what's going on with my money. He says, for what I'm doing, I don't understand. Have you ever been there where you're doing something and you don't understand why? I don't even understand why I'm doing this. He says, for what I want to do, I do not practice, but what I hate, that's what I do. Come on, if you can't see the perfect picture of a person that's in opposition to himself, look at the Apostle Paul. He's saying the things that I want to do, I'm not doing, and the things I don't want to do, those are the very things. I don't want to cuss you out, but I keep cussing you out. I don't want to do this. I don't want to look at that. I don't want to go there. I don't want to get that. I don't want you to see I, this is not who I am. It's just it's like you bring the worst out of me and, and this is not me and I don't understand and, and I don't understand why God wants me even to stay with you and you know can I get rid of you or, or whatever the case may be. What I'm challenging you to see is it possible that you might be in opposition to yourself. Paul says it this way in verse 18, for I know, notice he knows, you know, there, there's somebody put this thing, uh, know thyself. Notice what he knows. I know, you may not know what's in me, but I know what's in me. He says, I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. I want to, but how to perform what I want, which is good, I don't find, I don't know how to do it. What, what do you see here? You see a man who's conflicted, who is in opposition to himself. I hope you can relate. Verse 19 says, for the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I keep practicing. He says in verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am, have you ever been there? And then he asked the question, who will deliver me from this body of death? So I want to talk to you today about overcoming the obstacle of self. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 again. Verse number 15. 
There's two amazing things about this verse. This is a verse that I'll never forget in life. How many have ever pulled weeds before? Okay. There's, there's two things that are amazing in this verse because he talks about a weed or a root of something bad. In the first part of the verse, he says, I want you to look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now, if you've been around these parts, if you've been listening to any messages, we just finished a series not too long ago about accessing the grace of God. Amen. The grace of life, accessing the grace of life. And in that series, we learned that grace is amazing. Thank God for the understanding of grace. It's not by works. Come on. It's not by might nor by power that you're going to get to the next level in life. The Bible says, for it is by grace that we have been saved. That word saved encompasses five amazing things. It encompasses salvation, healing, deliverance, preservation, and prosperity. How you are actually going to get to the next level in life is the grace of God. It won't be your good looks that get you that promotion. Come on. It won't be your hard work that takes you to the, to the top. It's simply going to be God's unmerited gift of grace on your life. And I'm preaching good whether you say amen or not. Come on, the grace of God is amazing. So we just spent weeks, like 21 weeks, looking at how to access grace. But this verse of scripture tells you that if you got certain things going on in your life, you can fall short of the grace of God. Come on, somebody. We, we, we gave an illustration that grace is like a moving walkway. Recently, I was in the airport, and you all know they got these things in the, in, in, in the airport that will take you from where you are to where you want to be. How many of you all, there's a better place that you want to be in life? Come on. Then there is this thing called the moving walkway of the grace of God that all you have to do, you don't have to cook chicken dinners for it. You don't have to sing in the choir for it. You don't have to be perfect for it. All you got to do is just step on this moving walkway and it'll take you to where you want to be. But what if when you take that step, something trips you up and you fall short? Come on, what if you're about to, I mean, you just right there, you just want to get into it, and you trip, and you fall short of the moving walkway to take you to the place where you want to be. There's something that can cause you, that'll trip you up, that can pop up in your life out of nowhere and mess you up, and what we're about to read is when it pops up in you and messes you up, now you messing up people that's around you. You see in the second part of this verse in the King James, it says, look diligently so you don't fall short of the grace of God unless any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And then thereby many be defiled. See, in a marriage, you're not in it by yourself. And if there are things in you that are troubling you, they'll spring up from time to time and not only trouble you, but they'll trouble the person that's with you. So I ask you today, what if, what if it's just one thing between you and your next level, and what if that one thing is you? So here's the illustration. Uh, my brother, who's here today, love him dearly. We're 10 months and 29 days apart. Yeah, mom and dad. Amen. <laughs> and they just passed that down to my, my youngest brother. He, he got five of them, and some of them stacked up, man. <laughs> well, obviously, we're close, you know, and when we were young, we played basketball in the backyard. And we, I mean, basketball for us was taking a piece of plywood, and y'all remember those milk crates? And we get dad to saw out the bottom of the milk crate, and we'll nail, nail that thing to a piece of wood, and nail that wood to a tree, and that was, man, that was NBA in the backyard. <laughs> we played 21 for hours till it got dark, then dad bought a light, and we'd play out there. One time I can remember we wanted to go out and play, and my mom was like, well, you all got to pull the weeds out of the cracks. We're from Detroit, so, you know, you got to get the weeds out of the cracks, and 
you know, so we're like, oh, we don't want to do that. Well, we got to do that before we can play basketball. So we're out there, you know, rip, 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 rip. You know, we get all the weeds up. Now we can play basketball. Well, the next week comes, and we're like, we're getting ready to go play basketball. He's like, uh-uh, you got to go. Well, we just pulled them. And she said, well, you got to get them by the root. If you just deal with what's on the surface, it's going to come up later, and you're going to have to deal with it again. She took a butter knife. Showed us how to get down there to the bottom, move the green out of the way, grab that thing by the root. Come on, you grab it by the green, you can forget it. But you, so I guess somebody here know what I'm talking about, right? But if you get a hold of the root and you pull that thing out, then it ain't going to, maybe something else will grow back. But that won't grow back anymore. Reason why I say, I bring that an illustration up because that is exactly how to overcome the obstacle of self in your life. And I'm going to walk you through just, and we will be dismissed in a moment, the process of overcoming the obstacle of self. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to get down to the root. And if self is the problem, then that means you've got to deal with you. Psychologists and counselors, Dr. Phil, who makes millions of dollars helping people know this, that if you're ever going to really have true progress in life, you're going to have to identify the problem at the source. See, we keep having an argument about the toilet paper or the phone bill. And really, that argument is the green that pops up. But if we were to go a little bit deeper, we would find that there's a root cause to the argument that we keep having about the toilet paper. Because everybody knows we'll need to spend all that money on one ply <laughs> or two ply. We can, we'll be fine just with one ply. But really at the root, is a concern of why is it that you put your money in your account and I put my money in my account? How come we can't put our money together? And just for y'all in Facebook, ain't nobody saying amen. <laughs> you know, so we're driving in the car and all of a sudden we're arguing over the phone bill and really at the point where, you know, you know, to the point where we're starting to feel like we need to get divorced. I'm not talking about me, I'm using random illustrations, okay? <laughs> Where, where, where we're at the point where we're considering divorce, why? Because of a phone bill? Because you was on the phone with your mama on the cruise ship and now you done ran it up to a $200 bill? <laughs> Again, really, honestly, this ain't me. This is just random stuff, okay? My wife's in the back. Y'all can talk to her. This is just random stuff. But this stuff is real. You know why? Because now we're, we're really at the point where we want to throw in the towel over a $200 bill, not realizing that's just the surface. But what goes deep is you grew up in poverty. And you swore that you would never be broke. And so money has become a big deal to you. When you see certain things, it causes this thing to spring up, okay? Stop dealing with the surface and start dealing with yourself. How do you do that? I'm glad you asked. You got to get down to the root. Why are you so upset about these things? Why does what they do bother you the way that it bothers you? You got to get down to the root. How do you do that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11, it says this, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Okay, great. But look at the first part of this verse. And it's a powerful truth. Who knows you like you know you? Now, your spouse, you know, they probably have a good idea. And if they have been any amount of time with you, they probably know you better than everybody else in the world. And yeah, your mom and daddy and them, your brothers and them, your sisters and them. Yeah, they got a real good idea. But I can tell you this because the Bible says it. Nobody knows you like you know you. 
So in order for you to get down to the root, you got to have time where you sit down and ask yourself, what is going on in me? Why is it? Why is it that when she does this or when he does this or when my mom does this or when my dad says that, why does it bother me the, the way that it bothers me? Why when my boss talks to me a certain way, why does it set things off in me where I'm just ready to quit? And now this is my fifth job because I don't like you know, I'm just not going to let anybody talk to me. But if you took the time and got down to the root because your dad left your mom and he didn't he wasn't involved in your life now you got this issue in your heart and it manifests with anger in the classroom and you going off and not working right with people because of something that happened Y'all remember Cain and Abel. How is it that the first boys, the first brothers, how is it that they killed themselves? Well, if you ever had a brother, then you, could, you should be able to understand a little bit how you can get to that place. <laughs> but ultimately, what it comes down to is something deep in you. Cain brought an offering. Abel brought an offering. Cain wasn't right about the offering he brought. Abel was right about the offering that he brought. And they could, they could tell. And it bothered Cain. Something was in him towards his brother. He got so angry after this. What I want you to see is these two questions. Because what I'm teaching you is from God about getting down to the root. God asked Cain two questions to help him get down to the root of what's going on in him. He asked him, why are you so angry? That's a good question. And why has your, why do you look so dejected? So when you're overcoming the obstacle of self, these are two great questions that you should ask yourself. Why am I so, you know, why does it bother me that she asked me not to leave dishes in the sink overnight? And that one is real. <laughs> I mean, we can get it in the morning, man. I mean, come on. We live like in the model house. I mean, just overnight. But if I were to blow up and get so angry about something so simple, really, I should ask myself, why am I so angry about this? Why does it change my countenance? So the first thing is you've got to get down to the root. You've got to identify it. I can't, I can't take the whole day on one part, right? I need to give you all four, and then we go into something next week. But the second thing is once you identify, maybe it is, you know, the, the, the fact that your, your, your father isn't in your life. I was reading the scripture. I shared it with my brother. It amazed me. It was from our chapter that... To a child, the glory of a child is their father. I've often wondered, you know, how, why is it that fathers have such an impact in a child's life? There are grown people that have issues because of what their father did or didn't do in their life. One of the reasons is because to a child, their glory is their father. Well, if he wasn't in their life the way that he should be or could have been, then that's going to greatly impact their life. So the first thing you've got to do is identify it. It could be that you're ready to dump this marriage because you decided you were not going to be like your mom and them. She went her whole life being unhappy. And you decided you were never going to let a man treat you like this, talk to you like this, or do this. <laughs> and so you're ready to abandon it. Why? Well, for you, they didn't stay together. That touched you. Amen? So again, these things go deep. I don't have time. To, if you need counseling, call me. Amen? <laughs> but all it's going to be is helping you look in you and find out why does that bother you the way that it does. Okay? Second thing is remove it. You know, if you get past the top surficial stuff and you get a hold of this thing at the root, what's the next thing to do? 
pull it out. The Bible says in Colossians chapter three and verse number eight, it says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. The, the emphasis is not a complete list, but the fact that you have a personal responsibility to get stuff out of you that's hurting you. Is it okay if I preach today? So what do you do? You put it off of you. You get it out of you. There's another verse of scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Notice that the Bible says that we are to purge ourselves of things that are hurtful to us. Purge yourself. That sounds like a spiritual detox, don't it? I wish I had something that we could put in a punch that would be like a spiritual detox, right? So you can get stuff out of you that's messing you up in your marriage, right? Or that's messing you up in your life or, 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 or from keeping you from getting to your next level. But we don't have that concoction. You've got to purge yourself. You've got to get those things. You know what, I, and I keep wanting to get past this, but, but I sense that I need to stay here for a minute. I've got to go back to identify. Anger is not a root. It's a fruit. Why are you so angry? There's a root, something deeper than you just being upset about an offer. There's something deeper going on. The Bible talked about the root of bitterness. Let's talk about that for a moment. I learned this from a, a, a lady named P.B. Wilson. She wrote a book called Betrayal's Baby. In essence, the book was about bitterness is betrayal's baby. Betrayal is the result or is failed expectation. You didn't expect a loved one or a parent to molest you. So as a result of that, you are now, there was something born when that happened. You were betrayed, and so now bitterness is born. Is this too deep? Can I minister to you? Because if you don't deal with it, if you don't get the root of bitterness out, it'll keep troubling you, and now you got trouble in your marriage. You got trouble on the job. Come on. You got trouble in all of it because the things that ain't even connected to this person. It's stuff in you that you haven't dealt with. Bitterness is betrayal's baby. And it can show up in your heart. I see it in young men all the time. It's why we go to camp. Man, I'm going to need extra time today. It's why we go to camp. Because there's a little hole in his heart because of what his dad didn't do. Well, his dad is not keeping him from it. It's in him. And if I can teach him how to overcome that the right way, he'll get to the next level. Anybody can attest to that. So let me teach you that. This scripture says, let a man purge church of that. That's like a spiritual detox. There's another verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. He says, therefore, having these promises, and listen, child of God, these are some amazing promises that God has given unto us. He has promised that this year will be 10 times better than ever in our lives, in every area of our life. But in order for us to do that, we're going to have to overcome this obstacle. We have amazing promises, beloved, but in order to get there, we've got to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We've got to do what? Cleanse ourselves. Really? You can come in for counseling, but all I could do is direct you. You've got to be the one to deal with what you've got to deal with. I can help you, maybe ask a few questions to get you in the right direction, but really, you know you. You know what's bothering you and what keeps you. So what do you have to do? You got to remove it. Get it out of you. You say, well, how do you get it out? How many have ever drank milk out of a cup? Okay, well, that's some of Sorry. Yeah, if you put that cup in the sink, obviously you can't leave the cup in the sink overnight. Come on, y'all help me with that, right? <laughs> you put that cup in the sink, you know, okay, well, how do I get the milk out of a cup? This will help you in how to get stuff in you that shouldn't be or that's troubling you out of you. Run water in it. 
Because if you run water in the middle, I heard Pastor Travis give this illustration. I love it. I want to give it to you. If you just put that milky cup in the sink and turn water on it, it'll start. It'll be cloudy. And some of us are in a place right now where we're in a cloudy place. We got the word of God on the inside of us that tells us one thing. But then we got this other thing in us that makes us want to do something different. And so it's hard to choose what we're going to do because it's cloudy. But if you keep running water in that milky cup and just in a period of time, all the milk will be out and it'll be displaced by with nothing but water. If you got things in you that you need to get out of you, run water in it. What are we talking about? We're talking about Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. There's something powerful about the word of God that if you run it in your life, it'll get things that are deep things, that are bad things, that are things that are keeping you from your future. It will get out of you. Just keep running that water in you. Keep reading your chapter every day and every night. Yet again, it ain't up to them. You could be in a technically bad marriage, but have a good life. A good life. Come on, somebody. Why? Not because of them. Not because of things on around you, but because God is on your side. And as long as you got him, you got good. But you got to keep running that water in there. That's why I, with, without apology, I want to give you scripture. After scripture, I want to make my notes available. I want you to be able to listen to this again and again. I want you to be able to get into our Catch the Vision classes and our Equip classes and just keep running that water in you and let it wash over you. And you'll look up and you'll be changed into another man, the person that God absolutely created you to be. Amen? All right, so let's get on with it. Okay, so that's how you get it out. If you need more about that, just run the tape back. Listen to it again. If you didn't get it then, just run it back and keep listening to it until you got it. Amen? All right, but let's go on. Number three, you got to meditate, medicate that area. Roundup actually makes a product that after you pull weeds, that if you spray it in the cracks, they'll prevent weeds from ever growing up there again. So the third thing in order to get stuff out of your life that's actually keeping you from being where you want to be is medicate the area with the word of God. Oh, come on, y'all. Medicate it with the word of God. You know, Jesus talked about when a person deals with something really deep, like a spirit in their life, and it goes out of them. If you don't replace it with something right and good, they can come back with more besides. And the latter part of that individual is worse than before. Come on, somebody. You done forgave that person for what they did, putting hands on you, what they said. You done asked them to forgive you and they done ask forgiveness. But if you don't medicate that area, they can say something else. They can remind you of something else. And you can find yourself in a worse place with them than before. I said this earlier. The Bible teaches us to put no people and they bring up about the idea of trust in a marriage. I grew up in Detroit. We trusted you as far as we could throw you. The big deal in the Scott household where me and Marquita, Sister Marquita is, is concerned, is not her ability to trust me or my ability to trust her. We try to base our lives on the word of God and you search from beginning to end, you'll find very few, if any, scriptures that tell you to trust another person. But you'll find a ton that tell you to put your trust in the almighty God. I can tell you right now. Amen. Now, you know, I don't want her to be messing around with nobody else. I don't want her to be messing around with the money. I don't want her to be messing up with the kids. I'm not going to put my trust in her. I'm going to put my trust in God. And it goes vice versa because I can fall and mess up too. But if she puts her trust in the living God to keep me from making an unrecoverable mistake, how many of y'all know that gives him access to protect me for her interests. Amen? I don't got to be running around looking at her phone. <laughs> it's true. I got, I got the access and all of that, but you know, I'm not living like that. Why? Because my trust is in the living God. It just is. Where, 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 where were you last week? Amen. 
Where am I? <laughs> Thank you, sir. So you medicate it with the word of God. There's a scripture in the book of Proverbs, and it tells us to do that. It says that the word of God is life to those that find them. I'm done, y'all, so y'all can play soft music. They're life unto those that find them, and it's health. The word of God, the same thing that gets it out of you, that displaces it, is also the same thing that'll protect it and keep it from being reinfected. Right? You medicate, you treat it, put a chemical treatment on it, and that way weeds won't grow in there ever again. But then he says to keep your heart with all diligence. These are matters of the heart. You're talking about a failed expectation, that's deep. I married this person with the hopes that we would be for forever and they, they did this to me and they divorced me? That's deep. What bad things condition us is self-preservation. You know, let's say you hit me. Before I know it, I'm going to hit you back. You know, it'd be like, you know, but I know Jesus said, turn the other cheek, my bad, brother. You know, did you fall? Because, like, I'm, you know, what's happening here? I, re I reacted in what's natural, self-preservation. And in, in a relationship, when you hurt me, it's very natural for me to put up a wall to guard my heart. And then if I built up a wall where men are concerned or women are concerned, I punch out a little hole for the next guy or the next girl, but I got a wall because I'm never going to let that happen to me ever again. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody really hurt you and in your heart you say, you know what, I'm never going to let somebody ever get to me like that. That's a bad move. Because that wall that you build are built with bricks of bitterness and hardness. And now in this relationship or on this job or in this particular case, you're not as open as you should be because of the pains of your past. There's a right way to guard your heart and a wrong way to guard your heart. I'll just get to the point. The right way to guard your heart is to let God be the guard. He says, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it flow the issues of life. You don't want bad things springing up. You want God to be the guard. He said, I'll be your shield. Stand up on your feet. He said, I'll be your buckler. I'll be your strong tower. The fourth part of this, <clears throat> thank you all for your patience. I, I went way over time. But the fourth thing you got to do is you got to leave it alone. I'm going to talk about this a little bit next week when we talk about overcoming the obstacle of history. But what I will leave you with this is because you know, how many have ever had a little kid and they done scraped their knee and they keep picking at the scab? Guess what? They're never going to heal. Come on, a wound that you keep digging in will never heal. You ask some medical technicians, there's, there's healing that's designed even in the worst of conditions. But if you keep messing with it, Kids like to show you their wounds. And so I remember there was a four or five year old I was pastoring and, and there was a kid came up to me and said, Pastor, I, I, I scraped my knee. I was like, oh man. And he was like, yeah, I was on my bike and I fell. And, and then he put his knee up and he peeled the band-aid back and pulled the, the scab off and now it's bleeding again. And I see believers in the same way. They went through bad situations and they're in bad situations, but because they keep pulling the scab back, it won't heal the right way and it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up and up again. Am I ministering to anybody? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 and 18, do not remember the former things 
nor consider the things of old. Once you get down to the root of it, if it was daddy, if it was mama, if it was my husband or my wife, if it was my neighbor or my friend, my brother or a stranger, once you identify it, get it out. Let it go. If it's a betrayal, the Bible will tell you to forgive that person. Go over every scripture in the Bible that talks about forgiveness. What do you will be doing? Is running the water of the word about forgiveness. And it'll get to the place where you can forgive anybody of anything. Amen? But once you get it out, medicate the area with the word, but more importantly, leave it alone. Somebody say, leave it alone. Come on, say it like you mean it. Leave it alone. One of the biggest obstacles in relationships is past history. I'm going to pick up there next week. You don't want to miss this. The Bible says don't remember the former things. I'm talking about you. And in you, don't touch it in your thought life anymore. If they betrayed you, if they failed you, did something they should not have done, broken a covenant, broken a promise, and you deal with it, you talk about it, you get it out, and you're done with it, then be done with it. Don't touch it in your thought life. Give me a little more microphone, please. I don't know who this is for. I'll say that just to give me an extra minute. Amen. Uh, how can you not touch it in your thought life? They keep reminding me of it. They keep doing it. They keep saying it. And it, and it keeps coming. And pastor, I, want, I thought I forgave him, but he keep doing it. He, she keeps saying it. And, you know, just keep bringing it back up. Keep bringing it back up. Listen, child, God, we're talking about you. Nobody can keep you, right? We're talking about you. Don't touch it in your thought life. How can you do that? In the same chapter, in verse 25, God says, I even I am he that blotteth out thy transgression for my own sake, and I will not remember your iniquities. Does God have the ability to remember everything that we've done past, present? Yeah. But as an act of his will, he refuses to remember what we did. As far as the east is from the west, he removes it from us. God can do it. We can be imitators of God. We can say, you know what? What happened, happened. As far as I'm concerned, that's old. I don't even consider that. Now, if you got a new issue, deal with the new issue. But as far as those former things are concerned, don't remember it. Y'all get anything out of this word today? <laughs> Woo! Man, oh man. Hallelujah. Went farther than I wanted to go, but praise God. We'll be back here again. We encourage you. Oh, my gosh. Send this to somebody. Share this on your page. Get this message out. Praise God. We believe it will change your life. Amen. Amen. God bless you.